In this part of the January 2021 Camp Connection, we focus on regulatory developments in North America, both the notable developments in 2020 as well as key activities for 2021. We connect with Mark Herwig of Raytheon Technologies. With the ongoing pandemic, like many of us, Mark is working from his home. Hi Mark, can you provide us with an update on recent regulatory changes in the US and Canada? Hello, Jared. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some North America updates to our Chem Connection viewers today. Uh, we do have a few noteworthy items for both the United States and Canada. And um, I will focus my uh, uh, comments on primarily existing chemical regulation changes and some new activities that both governments, uh, the United States and Canada, have uh, done. And we'll talk about it in the context of 2020 and a few things that have come up in 2021. What were the most notable Tosca developments in 2020? Yeah, so for the United States uh, in 2020, um, <clears throat> a couple of items. Uh, the agency completed a uh, so-called fees rule, final fees rule, um, for actors that have interest in um, a number of the high priority substances that uh, the agency has decided to move through its risk evaluation and risk management process. <clears throat> uh, the, the fees rule um, is in place simply because the United States government uh, needs money to be able to uh, complete the risk evaluations. In the old days in doing this, the agency had its own uh, budget and funding for it, but um, now as the uh, reform TOSCA proceeds, um, this is a new concept for uh, uh, the government to get money to proceed with the risk evaluations and um, leading towards risk management and control. Um, and so I expect that this process of um, seconding fees from the respective actors in the supply chain will continue as uh, new batches of substances are identified and uh, being fed into the pipeline, if you will, for risk evaluation uh, in perpetuity until this process isn't completely done. So that's one item. Um, the agency also issued a few uh, final rules for uh, five PBT substances, persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances. These are sometimes called Fast Track 5 or the PBT 5. Um, <clears throat> these final rules are essentially in part bans uh, and <clears throat> with some exclusions and some exceptions uh, that are fairly narrow for some sectors, but in essence, it's uh, a ban. And um, these rules go into effect uh, very soon. And uh, an example of one of the substances is called uh, PIP31, um, phenol isopropylated phosphate. This is a substance that is commonly used in fuels and lubricants. Uh, and so if you're in um, the aerospace or automotive or uh, other sectors that involve themselves with fuels and lubricants, you might have interest in that one um, just by way of example. Uh, the agency also uh, initiated a number of scoping documents for other substances that have been prioritized uh, to move through the risk evaluation steps. Um, and <clears throat> they also uh, have completed just very recently some additional final uh, scoping documents for, uh, sorry, uh, final risk evaluations for some of um, the prioritized substances. So the essence of all of this is that the agency has a, a new structured process it needs to have money to be able to move them through the process. And it is, it is basically a batch type of process. So we have um, uh, you know, some, some former work plan chemicals, and now we have uh, 20 high priority substances as a first batch um, that are being uh, worked through and moving through this process. And once uh, some of these come off the list, they've completed their risk management process and new substances that the agency identifies will, will move into it. So it's, it's a big pipeline of risk evaluation and risk management and eventually uh, risk control. Uh, for the U.S. market. It is clear that the U.S. EPA has been very busy last year. How about the regulatory developments in Canada? So for Canada, 
2020, um, there were a, num uh, a number of draft and final screening assessments that um, had been completed last year. Um, an example of a final screening assessment um, is on the so-called phthalates category. Um, one of the things that, that the Canadian government has done, in my view, well with is um, uh, grouping or packaging um, substances into categories. And so, you know, there's many phthalates and they did assessments on a group of phthalates. And by way of example, um, uh, diethyl hexyl phthalate has been spiked out from that uh, process to proceed further into risk management and risk control in the market. Uh, the other phthalates that were evaluated um, according to their assessment did not warrant uh, putting you know, into the, the furthering process. So for now, I think they are just going to be as is. <clears throat> um, Further down the Canadian pipeline, if you will, um, a number of substances have uh, moved into final risk management actions. Um, an example of this would be Dechlorine Plus, which is a trade name product for a uh, chlorinated flame retardant. It has been around for decades. It's used in a wide variety of applications um, and is also subject to uh, regulatory action in the EU under REACH and is also uh, moving through the Stockholm Convention, the POPs Convention. Um, and so there's a lot of activity on this particular substance. And uh, we expect in Canada that in, in or around April 2021, a proposed uh, risk management action will be put forth in, uh, for notice and public comment. And um, it's quite possible that by the end of 2021, that will be finalized um, and perhaps be the, the first jurisdiction to have imparted um, strict control on, on that substance. Uh, the other thing that the Canadian government did in 2020 was uh, require a mandatory, uh, it's basically a mandatory information collection rule under Section 71. Um, and this particular one was for a list of 33 um, PFHXS compounds, perfluorinated uh, compounds. They're specifically listed by um, individual CAS number. And the comments, or sorry, the uh, collection of information based on the notice uh, was due to be submitted on November 20th. And, and this was a process to get uh, industry to provide um, as much more additional information that is available so to fill information gaps that the government has had on these substances so that they can proceed um, moving those substances through their screening assessment and risk uh, control process. So there's a lot of this going on right now, moving substances from point A to point B to point C, leading towards risk management and risk control. Um, one thing I'd highlight for both jurisdictions that is that they actually um, have very good websites uh, that for both of these categories of, of uh, activities on existing substances. Um, of course, they're structured a little differently, but uh, I, I would say, you know, it wasn't so much uh, uh, helpful and, and useful in the past, but um, their websites have come a long way and it's pretty pretty easy to navigate through and figure out, um, you know, what, what activity the government is working on today and, and both from, you know, up front in the pipeline in terms of identification of prioritized substances and moving through assessment or evaluation toward um, final risk management. So if, if uh, any of the viewers have not been to those websites before, um, I'd encourage you to, to go there if you have interest in, in business activity in these jurisdictions because they're, they're actually quite good. Mark, can you also provide us with a perspective on the key regulatory developments in the U.S. and Canada for 2021 that industry should be aware of? Yeah, so 2021. Um, so let's start in the United States. In 2021, uh, one thing that we've talked about and, and had presentations about in, in prior ChemCons is this uh, activity of the Tosca chemical data reporting rule. Um, that actually was uh, originally set to be reported on last year for activity for the prior four years. 
Um, <clears throat> but due to a number of factors, uh, not the least of which is the impact of COVID, this got extended. And so now the deadline for reporting on the Tosca CDR is January 29th this year, so January 29th, 2021. There were a number of changes in this particular, uh, or for this particular reporting period. Um, if you are um, having business activity in this country and you're not that familiar with it, the, the website for this program actually also is very good and it, it um, highlights the key uh, uh, changes for this reporting cycle that include things on, on how to do confidentiality claims and so forth. Um, Another topic that is notable for 2021 uh, in the U.S. is that related to HFC uh, compounds through legislation that um, was signed off at the very last minute um, at the end of the Trump administration in the U.S. It was uh, signed off and essentially enacted on December 27th, which requires now the U.S. EPA to uh, publish final regulation on the phase down of a set of, uh, initial set of HFCs that were uh, tabulated in the legislation. And the agency has to publish these final regulations by September 22nd of this year, of 2021. So that means that they will um, have to develop the rulemaking and, and, and cast it as a proposed rulemaking for notice and public comment uh, quite arguably quite well in advance of that September 22nd date uh, so that they can get comments from the market uh, leading toward whatever it is that they're going to establish for um, the final regulation. Now, <clears throat> this is a, actually a fairly complicated topic, and I know it's been addressed in other jurisdictions. Uh, but the way this has been set up in the U.S., it, it's actually fairly complicated in how um, how the substances were initially selected and, and the possibility that more substances will be added to the list by the agency based on uh, some algorithms and, and other characteristics. Um, and <clears throat> how that all gets baked into a particular phase-down uh, phase down schedule that the legislation puts forth um, remains to be seen. But... Uh, if you have interest in those particular um, HFCs because of uh, equipment that you produce, like cooling systems, chillers, uh, and in my case, uh, it would be applications for aircraft, commercial aircraft, for example, uh, it's um, important uh, to understand how that's going to affect the uh, supply chain and potential obsolescence over time. Um, <clears throat> Uh, another activity uh, for this year uh, in 2021 that was uh, imparted by issuance of a final, um, a recently finalized National Defense and Appropriations Act is um, the addition of 172 PFAS substances to the US EPA EPCRA Toxics Release Inventory Reporting Scheme, otherwise known as TRI in the U.S., EPGRA TRI. And <clears throat> the thresholds for these, if I remember correctly, is 100 pounds for the EPGRA activity um, criteria. And this is the first time ever under EPGRA that these substances are, are uh, required to be reported. It's a lot of them, 172. That adds quite, um, it's quite an addition to the uh, existing list of substances subject to EPGRA TRI. And uh, it's interesting to note in this case that, um, you know, PFAS is a group or category of substances that are of great interest uh, just about everywhere. Uh, this is not a unique um, activity. The, the addition of these substances is part of the overall, um, uh, let's, let's call it the EPA's PFAS work plan. Um, and this is just one particular item that has come forward now for, for uh, having to have completed in 2021, but there will be many more on this category of substances in the future. So with Canada, um, we expect more screening assessments to come along in 2021. Uh, I had noticed recently that manganese and aluminum will be part of that. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays itself out. 
Um, there have been final amendments already to, uh, or we expect final amendments um, to the prohibition of certain toxic substances regulations. Uh, that's how it's phrased in Canada. Uh, to be issued um, through what's called Gazette 2 or Part 2 of the Canadian Gazette, which is their official journal. Um, <clears throat> and we and this will cover things like PBDEs, uh, PFOS, PFOA, long-chain perfluorinated carbons, uh, Dechlorine Plus that we talked about before, and, and a couple of others. So again, we expect to see these uh, come out on or around April. Um, we'll see if that happens, and, and if the moon's aligned, they will uh, get completed by the end of this year. So if you are a company that has interest in, in that, uh, let's say, group of substances, types of substances in Canada, that might be a thing you have interest in uh, watching. Um, so those are just some examples shared for um, 2021. Is there anything else Camp Connection viewers should consider for North America? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Sheard. I, th what comes to mind is um, the TOSCA CDR program. I had mentioned previously or earlier in this segment uh, that reporting for it is uh, now extended to January, end of, end of this month. Um, uh, but what is not always clear to folks is that um, while the actual reporting for CDR is every four years, the obligation to collect, manage, and uh, essentially process for applicability under the criteria of the CDR uh, on an annual basis. So CDR reporting uh, these days is based on exceeding a particular annual threshold of the four years prior to the uh, prior to the reporting year. So, um, on an annual basis. So, uh, if we have reporting uh, that was in 2020, now January 2021 because of the delay. Um, those that have to report have had to look at the four years prior to 2020. So um, you may have, by way of example, not exceeded for a particular substance uh, that's on the TOSCA inventory in 2017, but you might have for 2018 and not for 2019. But the fact that you exceeded it in 2018 means that you are required to file the report the report, the CDR report, based on exceeding those thresholds. So it's not an accumulation of the four years, it's a look back, uh, in essence, the four years. But as a practical matter, that means that companies are obligated to manage and, uh, as I said, gather and process the information uh, every year. Uh, it's not unlike what, what uh, arguably has to be done for the upgrade TRI program because that is an annual reporting process. So it sort of forces you to have to manage um, uh, that information for applicability every year. CDR is the same way. It's just that reporting is every four years instead of every year. Uh, and it's not always transparent to, to folks uh, that, that that is required. So if you have business interests in the United States um, and, and you know work with chemical substances in terms of their presence on the TOSCA inventory, then the CDR is really important for you uh, to be managing on an annual basis. Many obligations. Any last thoughts on how industry could rethink and adjust their chemicals management approach? Yeah, that's a great question, Chaird. Um, you know, a few thoughts. If you think about just the items that I mentioned here for North America and you add on top of that or vice versa, if you are in Europe or, or Asia uh, in some countries that have chemical control schemes and, and you have now interests in North America, you know, this is all additive, right? It's, um, if you're a global business, you have to deal with all of this and, you know, what goes and what is right and proper from a compliance standpoint in the United States or Canada is not necessarily, uh, and, and frankly, mostly irrelevant when you're talking about the EU um, or South Korea or Japan, 
Australia, et cetera. And a lot of those jurisdictions have also been making moves with their schemes. Like, for example, Australia just got rid of um, essentially NICNAS and now is in the AICIS program uh, with a new structure of how to categorize substances for the market. So the Australia market. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's quite a daunting task if you're a global company to have to deal with all these various programs, EU Reach, ROS, Biocides, you know, the Skip database in Europe. We have all the Tosca stuff, the Canadian stuff I mentioned, and there are equivalent activities uh, in these other jurisdictions that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, so how do we, so how do you deal with this? Um, you know, one thing is to deal with the regulations, but foundationally to be able to uh, be effective against all those non-harmonized regulations, essentially, you have to have um, a really solid materials intelligence process and system, you know, getting information from within the supply chains and managing it systematically in your company and having it in a format that makes it, a, uh, allows you the ability to, um, you know, run queries and do different things because of the different regulatory schemes. Uh, so th I would say that, um, at least from my perspective, the, the days of Excel spreadsheets and the basic access databases for this type of work are gone. They're long gone. There are plenty of third-party service providers out there now that have many different kinds of uh, digital uh, platforms that um, can enable companies to uh, manage this information more effectively. Um, you know, it... it <laughs> There's not one size fits all. It depends on what kind of company and products you're, you're dealing with and what jurisdictions you're in, what languages you need. Um, so there's a wide variety of, of platforms available. You, you know, if you just have to work with one that satisfies your particular need, but without it, it's essentially impossible to deal with um, the plethora of all these not essentially non-harmonized regulations. Um, another concept that has been getting a lot of attention as of late. And, and uh, I will uh, admit that government, certain governments have been thinking about this um, sooner than industry has, from my perspective. Um, and maybe some folks will challenge me on that. But uh, I would say that because there is so, so much going on in this space, that it is getting increasingly difficult to handle uh, business process on a substance by substance basis. Uh, some of us that work in this space, we call it the whack-a-mole effect. Um, <laughs> it's a, an old arcade game where you're always knocking the, the moles that pop out of the machine down. Uh, you'll never get rid of that. That will, that will be a process, uh, at some level in perpetuity, but they're, there has to be a better way of managing this. And one of the, as I mentioned, one of the, the ways that um, uh, is being considered a lot these days is grouping. You know, the some of the governments have been doing the grouping uh, work. Um, there is, in certain places, uh, a lot to be said for doing that. Um, it, it allows you to look at, at your dependencies and your materials information management and your compliance obligations through a slightly different lens. And it also allows you to be more effective and efficient uh, internally when you're working with your engineering groups or material science or materials intelligence groups. So grouping in that case, by way of example, could be things like halogenated flame retardants, whether it's chlorinated, brominated, etc plasticizers, phthalates, there are other plasticizers besides phthalates, um, heavy metals, polymers, biocides, nanoscale materials. If uh, There are opportunities um, that are being exercised now to think of materials um, compliance requirements a little differently than has been the case historically. And uh, it's not to say that this makes this all easy, but there's the potential that it can make it easier to fulfill uh, the needs of your company or your business. So those of you that want to take it on, uh, have at it, give it a try. Uh, it might be um, 
you might find some benefit from it. Thanks, Mark. A lot of food for thought. And as always, also in 2021, a lot of things for industry to implement in North America.